ओम अज्ञान तिमिरंधस्य ज्ञानंजन शलाकाया चक्षुरं नीलितम् येन तस्माय श्री गुरवे नमः as the fruits and flowers of a tree in due course of time undergo six changes birth existence growth transformation dwindling and then death the material body which is obtained by the spirit soul under different circumstances undergoes similar changes however there are no such changes for the spirit soul for part This is a very important verse in understanding the difference between the spiritual soul and the material body. The soul is eternal, as stated in Bhagavad Gita. Na jaya temriyate va kada chinna yang bhutva bhavita vana bhuya ha ajo nitya shashvato yang purano na hanyate hanyamane sharire. For the soul, there is never birth nor death, nor having once been, does he ever cease to be. He is unborn, eternal, ever-existing, undying, and primeval. He is not slain when the body is slain. The spirit soul is eternal, being freed from waste and change, which take place because of the material body. The example of a tree and its fruits and flowers is very simple and clear. A tree stands for many, many years, but with the seasonal changes, its fruits and flowers undergo six transformations. The foolish theory of modern chemists that life can be produced by chemical interactions cannot be accepted as truth. The birth of a human being's material body takes place due to a mixture of the ovum and semen, but the history of birth is that although the ovum and semen mix together after sex there is not always pregnancy unless the soul enters the mixture there is no possibility of pregnancy but when the soul takes shelter of the mixture the body takes birth exists grows transforms and dwindles and ultimately it is vanquished the fruits and flowers of a tree seasonally come and go but the tree continues to stand Similarly the transmigrating soul accepts various bodies which un- various bodies which undergo six transformations but the soul remains permanently the same ajonitya shashvato yang purano nahanyate hanyamane shreere the soul is eternal and ever existing but the body is accepted by the soul are changing there are two kinds of soul the supreme soul the personality of godhead and the individual soul the living entity as various bodily changes take place in the individual soul different millenniums of creation take place in the supreme soul in this regard madhva acharya says shadvikara sharirasya navishnu stadgatasya cha tadadhinam shariram cha gyata tanmanujam tyajet Since the body is the external feature of the soul the soul is not dependent on the body rather the body is dependent on the soul one who understands its truth should not be very much anxious about the maintenance of his body there is no possibility of maintaining the body permanently or eternally antavanta ime deha nitya syokta sharire naha this is the statement of bhagavad gita the material body is antavat perishable but the soul within the body is eternal nikt nityas yogta sharirana lord vishnu and the individual souls who are part and parcel of him are both eternal nitya nityanam chaitanya chaitnanam lord vishnu is the chief living being whereas the individual living entities are parts of lord vishnu all the various grades of bodies from the gigantic universal body to the small body of an ant are perishable but the super soul and the soul being equal in quality both exist eternally this is further explained in the next verses in this verse prahlad maharaj is stating the basic truth of atma tattva or atma gyan knowledge of the self which forms the very basis of all spiritual knowledge if one does not have this knowledge then he doesn't have any spiritual knowledge that the soul is eternal and the body 
is temporary. Now, this is also admitted in Christianity, but they have the idea that the soul is created along with the body, and that the, only, the, only in the human body is their soul, the presence of the soul. But uh, Srila Prabhupada, in response to this, would point out that well, what is the difference between a human being and an animal? They have the same basic intrinsic characteristics that the animal, they, they go through these six changes, they have consciousness, they have emotions, they have feelings, they have desires. You may say, well, humans are more intelligent, but then we find that in some ways animals are more intelligent than humans. For instance, there are certain birds, arctic tern, they can navigate their way from the North Pole to the South Pole. They do it every year. And then, then they navigate, and they fly back again from the South Pole to the North Pole. Now, we can't do that. We don't have the intelligence to do it. We can by making instruments. But otherwise, uh, we cannot do that. Similarly, there are many uh, fish. The salmon is, uh, takes birth in fresh water, swims out to the sea, and at the time of mating, again comes back to exactly the same spot where he was born. So in some ways the animals have more intelligence. You see there are certain dogs, Labradors, they are trained as guide dogs. They they're, have the intelligence by which they, they know how to guide blind people, or collie dogs, they're specifically good for rounding up sheep. So, human being can't do that as well as a, as a collie dog. So, the human being takes the help of the collie dog. So, in some ways, animals have more intelligence. And sometimes you find that human beings are not intelligent at all, even by uh, materialistic standards. They're, they're what is called intellectually or mentally retarded. So they have very little intelligence whatsoever. Or sometimes a human being is kept alive, although his intelligence is completely, his bodily activities, are, they are made to continue to function by, uh, by use of machines. But his intelligence is completely dead. He's, he's a vegetable, as they call it. It's just like a vegetable. So the animal... Any normal animal in that circumstance, or any, any animal would have more intelligence manifest than a human being in that condition. So, to say that the human being has a soul because he has more intelligence, is uh, this argument is not universally applicable. Rather, the difference between a living being and a non-living being is the presence of consciousness, which is present even in the plants and in all species of life. The modern atheistic idea is that matter is simply a combination of... Sorry, life is simply a combination of chemicals. And there's the principle of survival of the fittest, that those who are those species that are more adept and, uh, and adapted to, more adept in the art of surviving, and more adapted to the conditions, they can survive, whereas those which are not, do not. But then the question comes, that why if matter, if, if life is simply a transformation of matter, then why should the transformation of matter that we call a human being or a worm or a fly or a snake or a turtle, why should that desire, why should that combination of chemicals desire to continue to exist in that particular formation? If it's only matter, then why should, why should the 
human being be afraid of terrorism, for instance? Why should he be afraid of pain? If it's only matter, then as some scientists have proposed that uh, if, we, if someone drops a hammer on our toe, instead of saying, ouch, that hurts, we should say, my B fibers are, are firing. Because it's all, there, there's, there should be no experience of pain. And, and there should, he should be totally neutral. He should, and why, why should we desire to eat? We feel hunger in the stomach, but then it's only, we're only matter and it's only a transformation of chemicals. And why, why should there be any feeling anyway? The, the table doesn't have any feeling. So, or a table, or a chair, or a microphone, it doesn't protest if you smash it with a hammer. And why, if matter is, sorry, life is only a combination of matter, then why do they distinguish between vandalism and murder? If you take a, a, a chopper, a hatchet, and smash someone's car up with it, then you're liable to be arrested and put in prison. But if you take a hatchet and chop a human being to pieces, then the punishment will be more severe. Why? If both are simply combinations of chemicals, then why do they adjudge that uh, chopping up a human being is called murder and is punishable with death or a severe uh, prison sentence, probably life sentence, and chopping up a car, it'll be a less severe sentence. Why? If it's all just different combinations of chemicals. Practically, it is uh, inherent or intrinsic in the law that life is significantly different to non-life. If you insult a car, ah, oh, you're such a useless car, you're such an ugly car, no one's going to take you to court. The, the owner of the car might punch you out and then you might take him to court. But if you insult a human being, you're such a jerk, you're a slob, and all this, he, he, he might, you, he could take you to court and, uh, and claim damages. Why? What is the difference? So, practically, everyone knows that life is a different principle to that of matter, even though life, as we perceive it, is manifest through matter. But yet it is, the presence of life is significantly different. Similarly, we don't lament. Someone dies. Uh, we lament. Uh, but if the car gets old uh, and is no more longer usable, we may also lament, but not in the same way. We don't perform a ceremony and invite people. And that we, now we're going to take our car to the scrapyard and we just like to invite people and we put a photo in the newspaper and a year later we, we have a ceremony to this was the day that our car was sent to the scrapyard and <laughs> all start crying it's ridiculous isn't it practically everyone knows we, we know that the life is something different from matter but we're so damn stupid dull headed that we make theories apparently scientific theories to uh, reject such a theory. Similarly, the same thing, I say this wherever I go, that if someone dies, we say, he's gone away, my father has gone away. In every language of the world, uh, in, uh, I mean, I don't know many languages, in Hindi they say, chalega, means the same thing, gone away. In Bengali, chalegeche. Same thing, gone away. Anyone know any other languages? Have any linguists here? Hmm? I know Marathi. 
Marathi. How do you say Marathi? He's gone away. Soregala. Sorugala. Means that, that means gone away. Gela means gone. So in any language of the world, when someone dies, one way you can say he died, but you can also say gone away. So what went away? The same body is there. You're crying, oh, he got away. No, he's still there. Yeah, but he's, he's, he's gone away. No, he's still there. Come on, what are you crying about? The same, he didn't go anywhere, he's right here. But he's dead. What are you saying he's gone away for? Who, what, went away? Nothing went away. The body is still there. You're thinking the body is the person. But by saying he's gone away, practically we recognize that the, we, the body is not the person. So, it's something which everyone can intrinsically feel. But, due to wrong propaganda, in the modern age especially, not only in the modern age, there are, there are atheistic theories in every age, but especially in the modern age, it's systematically taught in the schools how we have this, how these bodies have come into being simply from matter. And there is a strong move at the present time to have creationism taught in the schools that everything is made is, is it made by God, but it is rejected as unscientific by the same people who also lament when their father or whatever goes away. Of course, they may not lament because they think, well, now I'll get the inheritance. But uh, at least they say, he's gone away, so now I can enjoy the inheritance. So, this knowledge, this is required in human society. The modern civilization is based on the, they, they talk about primordial soup, but they have a primordial mistake that life is a product of matter. And practically, <coughs> Prabhupada, if we see his preaching in the Western countries especially, how much did he emphasize on this point? That if people could simply understand this point, that we are eternal, then simply by understanding this, their whole outlook on life would immediately change. Because if we understand that we're eternal, then this life, we don't, the, the, the idea of this life, we, it's not so important that we have to try and cram in as much sense gratification as we can. I mean, if we think we're eternal, uh, if we understand that we're eternal, even if we're interested in sense gratification, we can start to think about sense gratification in a future life also. And understand that, uh, if we understand that we're eternal, then um, immediately the question of why living beings are created differently becomes described. That is described in science as by chance. That by, by chance, different bodies are born in different ways. But as Prabhupada pointed out, as soon as you say by chance, it's no longer science. Because science means to observe order within nature and to explain it according to laws. Now, if you say chance, what it means, Prabhupada caught them out, you don't know what's going on because science means to explain. And if you say by chance, there's not an explanation, then you can say anything by chance. How did the apple fall on Isaac Newton's head? By chance. But then Isaac Newton, by falling on his head, it dung, sparked off some activity in his brain. And he thought, gravity! So, up until then, people might have thought just by chance. But then, uh, he thought, oh, there's a law of nature. 
there's something going on that we weren't aware of. So simply to say by chance means, well, uh, we are we're all scientists, we've come together and had a big conference and we decided that the whole, we, we have very scientifically ascertained that the universe comes into being by chance. That means that you can talk science, this, that and the other, but actually you don't know. And that there is order within the universe means that it didn't come into being by chance. Because nothing where there's order, that means, whenever there's order, that means there's some rational, intelligent control. If, you, if we see a room is very nicely and tastefully arranged, with maybe some house plants in one corner, and the sofa in one corner, we understand, someone has arranged this. And if we, if it's just a, we walk into a room and it's a complete mess and it's all dirty, we understand that probably no one lived here for years. Therefore, there, there, there are rats running around and cobwebs and lizards, you know, because no one, or no one put it in order. So order means intelligence, purpose, design. But the so-called scientists not wanting to recognize the order, design, and intelligence of the Supreme Being most unscientifically state that it has come into being by chance. So, <clears throat> Prabhupada very much wanted that these books would be distributed to give knowledge to human society. He very much wanted this life comes from life, these conversations to be, these transcribed and edited conversations to be uh, distributed widely. And he also put a lot of emphasis on Bhaktivedanta Institute. He was prepared to give them, he said, any amount of money. You hold conferences, you meet scientists, and you convince them in scientific terms. If we say, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, they're not going to listen. They'll say, that's not scientific. So you have to put it in scientific language. Prabhupada very much wanted this, that the so-called science, which is the bastion, or the, the, uh, the mainstay of the atheistic theory that life arises from matter, this should be overcome by devotee scientists who can give the proper understanding that everything is not simply chance. That, uh, as Lord Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Aham sarvasya prabhavo matas sarvam prabhatate Everything is generated by Krishna. Everything comes from Krishna. This should be understood. Mayadhyakshena prakriti suyate sacharacharam this material energy is running on under Krishna's direction. Everything moving and non-moving, it's all going on under Krishna's direction. It is not simply by chance. Scientists, they study the incredible order within nature and then they come to the foolish conclusion. Although they're very intelligent to uncover various secrets of nature, no doubt. But their conclusion is most unintelligent and that unintelligence is born from the uh, arrogance of thinking that by studying nature we are controlling it and therefore we don't need a God in our system. Unfortunately for them, well actually fortunately everything done by Krishna is good. Uh, they are reminded from time to time that they are not the controller. Now, what about this Hurricane Katrina? They, they made so much uh, endeavor to stop mass death by terrorism. But what will they do when the hurricane comes? There's no scientific device that they can do to stop that. They may have scientific devices to scan people at the airport and make sure that, 
and to they have so many security arrangements they, when I landed in America this time they scan the iris of your eye and they take your thumbprint and it's all meant to stop terrorism so they say but what will they do when the hurricane comes and kills far more people than any terrorists could imagine then what will they do uh, they are controlled they are uh, they say we are controlling and we're making life better, but there's one, at, there's at least one factor in every human being's life which the scientists, one factor which no one likes and which the scientists cannot even imagine to control, and that is called death. If you're not killed by terrorists, if you're not killed by hurricane, then there is what they call natural old age death, that all the systems finally just wear out, or by so many different things, by cancer, by AIDS, by heart attack. Now, we find the scientists are spending so much money for investigating cures for various diseases, such as AIDS, cancer, uh, what other diseases, There's so many... Mm. Say it? Cerebral, cerebral vi fibrosis? Brain shutdown. Then uh, Alzheimer's disease, and so many diseases they're trying to find a cure for. But why aren't they trying to find a cure for death? Did it, did it never occur to them that they should try to find a cure for death, to stop death? Why is there no department in the, in the universities that to try to stop death altogether. Why are they not investigating? That they're not investigating means that, or it suggests that, deep down inside, they understand this is beyond our control. We cannot do anything about it. That we can stop we, we, we hope to stop cancer and then death by cancer, but the how to stop old age. I mean, now they say you, there's a whole craze that's come up in the last 20 years, antioxidants. You should take and vitamin E, and in this way you stop aging, but no one stops aging. You can, you can drink gallons of antioxidant formula, juice or in, in take dozens of vitamin E tablets every day and still you're going to grow old. You can do yoga, stand on your head, put your legs up behind your neck, do all this kind of thing. Still the body will get old. There's no stopping it. Time is the destroyer of the body. Of course, by yoga it is possible to Prolong the life. Yesterday, the day before, I was talking. Was it yesterday? I was talking about yeah, yesterday, last night. I was talking about yogis, so they live for hundreds of years. But they also have to die. And how they live? They live in caves and they're doing austerities. And what's the use of such a life? <laughs> what's the use of a life anyway if you're not chanting Hare Krishna? So. Uh, all these endeavors, we shall live long, but then why don't, they, why don't they find that chemical, that injection? If they say that life is simply a combination of chemicals and medicine means uh, providing chemicals to cure or performing surgery that will cure, then why not find out that drug or that surgery which will stop death. That they're not even thinking of. They can't even define. They, they, they don't even know what actually is death. They can say, they can define its symptoms, that the circulatory system stops, the respiratory system stops, the brain ceases to function, brain waves no longer show up on the graph. But what is the 
intrinsic difference. Why should this happen? If we say that survival of the fittest, then if we say that the living being or, or the living or the combination of matter which we call organic systems has an inbuilt desire to survive, then why didn't it, it evolve to the point where there's no death? Difficult questions for the scientist. Not for the devotee, because he has transcendental knowledge imbibed from Prahlad Maharaj and his representatives. That the body is anyway never living, but it acquires the semblance of life due to the presence of the soul. As long as the soul is present, the body exists. The, the body continues to exist in what appears to be a living form. And as soon as the soul goes away, then uh, you can inject chemicals, you can freeze the body, but anyway, it will, it will cease to function. There's nothing we can do to resuscitate a dead body, notwithstanding Frankenstein stories. When a body is dead, it is dead. And in civilized society, they burn it as quick. Well, then, if, 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 if during daytime someone dies, they have to be burned before sunset. And if after sunset, at night, if, they, if the body dies, they have to be burned before the next sunrise. So maximum, because in India, the, the maximum length of day or night is 13 hours throughout the year. So the maximum time that the body will, uh, will remain after death is say, 12 hours or 13 hours. No keeping it and everyone comes and has a look and pays their last respects and all this kind of thing and then bury it in, in the ghost ground. The, the burial ground is the, the ghost ground. But uh, immediately, whoever it may be, famous, rich, powerful, as soon as the body is dead, burn it. Or in the case of a great saint, then only is buried. Or the Parsis, they have an unusual system. There's a community called the Parsis in India. It's a separate religion from any other. It's just a small community there. Fire worshippers. So they have a system when someone dies, they have a very high tower. And they take the body up onto the high tower and the vultures come and eat it. That's how that that's their method of getting rid of the body. I've seen also once uh, often you see what happens with the the poor people who are just living on the street, they have no relatives or anything. In, in, in the modern cities, there's a, an arrangement whereby by the municipality they take out dead bodies and they take them to the burning ghat and they burn them. Otherwise, the relatives do. But in the case of destitute people, then there's no one to take out and what are you going to do? I saw once, we were driving, just came from Howrah Station, in, just opposite Calcutta. So we went to, in the tunnel... We saw, we were just coming out the tunnel to go under the Ganges, under the Ganga, and there was lying a dead body just on the street. That's, so, so they take them out and they, they, they have to burn them. But uh, burning a body takes quite some time. So what, they, what I've often seen is the municipal worker, they don't want to wait for the whole body to burn. So they just burn it a little bit and chuck it in the river. Because the, the burning gas on the edge of the river so you, one time I, in Patna, I went down to take a bath in the Ganga, and uh, so much stink. I saw the place I was going to take bath. A dead body had floated to the to that place where I was going to take a bath. Another time in Mayapur, I went to take a bath, and I, the Ganga flows very fast. So I saw this body all bloated up, going past very quickly with a crow. Take it on the on the island, which was the body. The crow had landed. Was pecking out the eyes. They like the eyes best. 
The crows, they like the eyes best, and the, the dogs go for the intestines. That's their favorite part. That's what they eat first. So, by the arrangement of nature, when, there's a, when a great battle is to take place in, 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 any, in any place where, uh, in any land where there are vultures, the vultures will gather. They know. Even before the fighting has started, they know, oh, now we're going to get some food. Lots of eyes we have to eat. That's why it's considered very in, it's considered inauspicious if vultures gather in some place. It means there's going to be some death. So uh, this Vedic culture, a different perspective on death altogether. One devotee was telling me um, that out of curiosity himself and another devotee at Varanasi, where there's the famous burning guns. Famous because there's always lots of business. Around 24 hours, there's always someone being taken to burn there. Which you could expect in a big city, it's a big city, but particularly people go there to die. Because it's said that if you die in Varanasi, then you get liberated. And actually that's a fact. By the grace of Lord Shiva, Lord Varanasi is the city of Lord Shiva, one gets liberated. Not that Lord Shiva has the ability to liberate by himself, but when anyone dies in Varanasi, he comes and whispers in their ear, Ram, Ram, Ram. And by hearing the name of Ram at the time of death, they get liberated. So in Gujarati language, there's a saying that you live in Surat and you eat very nicely, and then you die in Varanasi. So, have a good life. Enjoy it in this life and get liberated at the end. And, and nowadays they, they made a train that runs from Surat to Varanasi. So, I guess that's for all the, the dying Gujaratis who have eaten so nicely throughout their lives. They can go there. So, the, many people go there simply to die. Of course, the Vaishnavas, they, the Gorya Vaishnavas especially, they go, Gorya Vallabh Nimbarka Sampradaya, three Sampradayas, they'll go to Vrindavan. To die. But uh, the Shaivas, the Smartas, the Mayavadis, they'll go to Varanasi. So all the time there's, there's burning at the ghat, dead bodies there. So these devotees, they went there to see what's going on, and they saw one man was, uh, was also sitting there sitting there watching one pile, a huge pile of wood for the body burning. It needs, needs plenty of wood to burn a body. So he saw a devotee and said, Oh, where are you from? I said, Well, we're from here. Yeah. What is in India overseas devotees? We're from Croatia. He said, Oh, you're with this gone? Yes. That's very nice. He was talking with them, chatting with them. And then he looked over and said, that's my mother. She was, he's in a very relaxed kind of way. That's my mother. He said, she was also a very pious woman. She was initiated in Goryamat and she would chant 64 malas every day. And he made an indication like this. She's going up. <laughs> so not concerned. And no artificial showing of crying. He said, mother's died and she's very pious and she's going up. She's going up to be with Krishna. So, no lamentation. Nashotat, no. What does uh, Krishna say in Bhagavad Gita? That they don't lament for the body. He understands that uh, the mother is, uh, was a jiva within that body. Now the body is finished. There's nothing to do with it now, to that, but to burn it. But it's auspicious because she's growing up. And he knows that one day I'll come back here and someone will be putting me on the fire. My, this body. He knows that. So he knows that I also have to chant Hare Krishna. I have to chant Hare Krishna and you go up. Otherwise, Urdhvanga chanti satrasto madhye teshtanti rajasaha jaganya gonavritisto adhoga chanti tamasaha Those who are pious, who act in sattva gun, they go up to the heavenly planets. Those who are acting in the mode of passion, they come back in human form to the 
uh, earthly planet, and those who act in the abominable mode of ignorance, like almost every member of the human race at the present time, has to go down to the abominable lower species. And Madhyajino Piyantima, those who worship Krishna go to Krishna. So this knowledge requires to be distributed in human society. People are inflicting suffering on themselves and others and forgetting Krishna simply due to lack of this knowledge that we are not the body, we are eternal spirit soul. We are part and parcel of Krishna as is so kindly explained by Sri Pallad Maharaj uh, given to us by Srila Prabhupada here in this verse and purport. Hare Krishna. Is there any question, please? Yeah. Just a comment, Maharaj. The difference between India and here, uh, here we go to great lengths to like, hide there. You go to great lengths to hide, yeah. Hide the suffering of old age and death. I was reading in a, in a book about the, an American devotee who had gone to Israel and he was going among the Druze communities and he mentioned how he went in a home and there was an old man there who was obviously dying and he said they made no endeavor to cover it up and it struck me as strange because I live in a culture where it's not covered up. It's a very, I mean, people, they don't try to hide away old people as if to pretend that it doesn't exist. But it's a, it's a very common thing. And it's a normal, it's a normal, actually it's only now that they start in India, these old age homes, aping the West. Otherwise old people live at home, or they may go to Varanasi, or they may go to Vrindavan to die, otherwise they stay at home. And everyone sees, they grow old, they become infirm, and then they die. Not, they don't try to hide it. And, and it's not that... They, so many times I've been present when people... I mean, not at the exact moment, but in a village, someone dies, and you wake up in the morning and there's a, there's a funeral pyre burning, or they take out, you see them take out the dead body. So it's a more realistic approach to life. Yeah, please. Is that a question? It's not really a question. There's no doubt that India is more conducive than America. The whole culture is so much more favorable for being Krishna conscious than in America. Ah, well, if you see Krishna consciousness, <laughs> is Krishna consciousness a third world religion? No, Krishna consciousness is the, it's not a religion in the ordinary sense of the term. It is the natural function of the soul. When we say India is more conducive for spiritual life, then we're not talking of India in socio-economic, anthropological terms. But in the spiritual terms, India's, if you think India's third world country, well, America's a, a ninth world country spiritually. <laughs> Go teach that in the schools. Generally speaking, being born in India is more conducive for taking on Krishna consciousness, yes. Generally speaking. It doesn't mean that everyone in India is a saint by any means. But it means that one has a better opportunity by the, not only by the culture, but there are so many holy places, so many temples, which one can take advantage of. So many holy rivers, which even unconsciously, by seeing, by bathing in, uh, one becomes purified. So it, it is an arrangement of Krishna that persons who are pious, they tend to take birth there.
Certainly, there's more of a contrast of cultures if one is Krishna conscious in America than in India. I mean, our movement is very well accepted and respected in India. Whereas in America, there's some level of acceptance now, but it's seen as some kind of cultural oddity, I would think. In India, it's very much part of the mainstream. I mean, uh, a temple in Delhi was opened by the prime minister, or, you know, it's the prime minister of the second most populous country in the world, and, and uh, like that, the president opened our temple in Bangalore, and like that. And in our in our centers, just like in Baroda, where I'm based, the the uh, at the major festivals, all the big politicians they come, and like that, it's considered. Mainstream, like I say. Hmm. Hmm. Have you been, you've not been to India, I presume? No, I have been. Please go. Please go. Yeah. It'll. Most devotees or even non-devotees find it a. What's what's the word for that? A life-transforming experience in a positive way in a very positive way. But it's good to go with devotees. Don't just wander around by yourself so that you can get things in perspective. Otherwise, when devotees from the West go to India, first of all, they're often overwhelmed by the, by the heat, the dirt, the flies, the mosquitoes, and they, that's what all they... They tend to see that, and they often get... The, the, the discomfort of life as compared to America is quite stark. But if one can see beyond that and, and feel the pulse of the spiritual culture, it takes some time actually to get used to that, to, to, to get the benefit of that. I wrote that book, Glimpses of Traditional Indian Life, which I could have given you, but I don't have any copies here, which gives some idea but it's it's definitely a, a, if for persons who are uh, seeking spiritual elevation, and certainly it's a, uh, what's the word edifying experience to go to India to at least go and uh, to spend some time there. Yeah. Oh, he doesn't make it so difficult, but the difficulty is there to see if we're actually devotees. Because it's easy to say, I love someone, as long as they're patting us on the back and feeding us with grape juice. But if there's difficulty, then love is tested. So that is just some difficulty that one goes through to see that one is actually sincere to serve Krishna and not one to simply use Krishna for oneself. And then going through that, one enjoys eternally a life of transcendental bliss with Krishna in the spiritual world. And for a devotee, the difficulty is actually blissful because then he feels the presence of Krishna even more feels that Krishna is being very kind to me by taking away all my material attachments and helping me to understand the nature of this world. And now I have a question for you. Do you read Prabhupada's books? Which have you read? Quite a few. Quite a few, yeah. It seems you're having a little difficulty to, to grasp what is the essence of that. Or maybe you're just asking questions to elucidate the matter. A lot of reading, yeah. Yeah, okay. Ah, but and ultimately, but ultimately, it can't be understood simply objectively. That's that's we're brought up in America, so you were raised to think that we can understand everything objectively. But some things are subject, many things, the best things are subjective. 
pleasure is not, an, not something, pleasure and pain are not understood objectively. Just like, I, ah! Oh, don't say that. My B fibers are firing. <laughs> experience, experience is not something that we can objectively categorize. Spiritual experiences, I mean, you can also study them. There's that famous, uh, who was that? Was it Skinner wrote The Varieties of Religious Experience? But you, as much as you study it, you don't experience, a study is something different to experience. That's why the scholars of religion, they learn so much about different religions, but they, by their very approach, they can never experience it. They can only study it. The example is given, you must have heard this, of the honey bottle. You can, stu you can study the, hun uh, the, the, the bee is licking the outside of the honey bottle, but cannot taste what the honey tastes like. So we can study religion, but we have to put our heart into it, leap of faith. Then only we can, we, can we enter into it. Love, we're talking about love of Krishna. Love is not something objective. Love is blind. <laughs> but we also suggest look before you leap. <laughs> look before you leap, but uh, leap. So I find it interesting that you say that you know, you, you know this or whatever, that I'm not giving it. Yeah. My endeavor is to try to understand why I'm not giving it. Well, well, I'm telling, I, I'm suggesting that you objectively consider that the objective method is insufficient to completely understand everything. Please consider it. Dr. Spock. Let's finish here. Hare Krishna. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Sri Guru and Sri Gauranga. Hare Krishna.